Welcome back to Not Your Forte Podcast, a music education podcast geared towards helping college students survive and thrive throughout their undergrad and prepare them to go out there and teach. I'm Eric Tinkler, a fourth year music education student here at Kansas State University. And usually I'm joined by my fantastic co-host, Dr. Philip Payne, the music education advisor here at Kansas State University. But I'm recording this intro a little bit after the fact. This, this week for uh, the episode of the podcast, uh, Dr. Payne gave an absolutely phenomenal presentation at the Kansas Music Educators uh, Conference this, this past weekend, as I mentioned, and we both felt like this is something that was really worth sharing with, with all you guys, our listeners, and it's just some really impactful stuff um, that Dr. Payne and his team were able to look into, research, and present uh, at this conference. Um, just quick thing before we get into the, the bulk of the episode, uh, just make sure you take, take a second or two, pause, pause the episode, subscribe, like, like the podcast, rate five stars, whatever the, your, wherever you're listening is asking you to do that. That's a small thing that really helps us continue to grow, um, as, as a podcast so that more people can see us, more people can listen to the things we talk about. Um, it's it's something I feel very passionate that this is a project in which we'll continue to grow and grow and grow and help out help out more people because music ed students or music students in general there there's a lot of things that you just you don't learn in the classroom a lot of things you don't know a lot of resources you don't know are available and I think Dr. Payne and I uh, will continue to provide a great resource for 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 these students to be able to further their education and just grow and develop into the best possible music teacher in which they can be. So anyways, let's go ahead. Let's get on to Dr. Payne and I'll check back with you at the end. Normally, the, uh, KMEA puts somebody in to uh, preside and to do the introduction, but they put me as the presider. So I will go ahead and introduce myself. <laughs> That's right, so I'll promo myself a little bit. My name is Dr. Payne, I'm the Chair of Music Education at Kansas State University. And we've got, I've got a lot of information to share with you today. Some of it is going to be, uh, it might be a little jarring. Some of it might be kind of like, well, duh, why haven't people talked about this more? And then I wanna spend some time, I wanna leave some time for questions and I want to leave some time for us to be able to discuss what are some of our um, options moving forward and how, how you can advocate uh, for yourselves through this process. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background of the study itself. The study started actually in 2015. And uh, I was teaching a research class. And in this research class, we wanted to find out, we know that students are stressed, okay? We understand that we push them to the limits, but we wanted to find out well, where is that source of stress coming from? What's going on and why does it keep happening? So we sent out this information and we, at the last minute, we threw in this little question and we said, on a scale of one to 10, rate your physical health. How do you feel physically? Rate your academic health. And then we said, rate your mental health from one to 10. Okay, now this is in 2015. And it came back that physical health was about a 6.5, so not too bad. Academic health was like a 7.2, which again, isn't too bad. They felt, they, they were perceiving themselves as being really good academically. And then mental health came back at like a 5.1. Big difference, and we were like, this ain't right. And it started to jive a little bit, because I'm also lead advisor at K-State, and so I get to talk with students on a daily basis. Um, and it kind of jived with what I was seeing um, when I would see students struggle and how we would interact with each other. And so I, I turned it over um, at that time and said, hey, I think we probably need to address this a little bit. Because at that time I was still junior faculty, so there wasn't really a lot that I could do at that point. And so I said, I think we need to check this out. And they're like, yeah, that's kind of troubling. So. Um, it sat for a little while and never went anywhere. So in 2017, it came back around and I had, I taught the class again and I said, this time we're going after this um, full board. And what we found was that we, we looked at depression, we looked at anxiety, we looked at sleep disorders, we looked at 
everything, but we wanted to say, what is the day in the life of a music ed major? What are the struggles and what's happening? Not knowing what was going on. What we found there is that um, the, the students were, the music ed students at, in 2017 um, reported a high level of depression, high level of anxiety, um, and they, they reported being overstressed. Now at this point, we didn't know what we were looking for because we were like, well, we could say that maybe we are or we could see it, but we didn't have any numbers to put with it. Well, this started to open up Pandora's box and that brings us to today. And so what we also find out is that this is something that has trended upward. Uh, even with, so every year they do a mental health study uh, for, for the colleges. It's uh, put out through um, a place in Michigan and this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Anxiety and depression are um, emerging trends in uh, collegiate uh, uh, populations. So we wanted to look at, we wanted to go a little bit deeper. We wanted to look at um, what are students across the nation saying? What are the, how do they feel? What are, what are their experiences and why is this happening? So here, um, one of the things that we find is that there's not effective coping mechanisms for a variety of reasons. And that's a little outside of the scope of this study, but we don't spend a whole lot of time telling you how or providing effective strategies for how to um, uh, combat or how to um, address these issues. And so one of the things that we want to look at is that, and then conversely, they're affected by the turbulent ideas of uh, feeling anxious and not having enough time to get things done. And so all of this bubbles over. The NHCS survey indicated that 24.3 of students uh, being diagnosed or treated by a professional for anxiety and 20% being diagnosed or treated for depression within the last 12 months. And that's college-wide, that's not just music, okay? We're gonna look specifically at music, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of background of what we're working with. We have to address mental health. And part of uh, why I wanted to share this with you is not to scare, but to inform. Because right now, a lot of times, what in, is a misunderstanding of anxiety, a misunderstanding of depression, and so the people that will be your best advocates are yourselves. And, and we'll talk more in the discussion a little bit, and I wanna, and I wanna pick your brains a little bit on what, what do you have available to you? Do you know what you have available to you on your, uh, very, at your, your various universities? Okay, the impact uh, can be healthy, uh, uh, healthy approaches to coping. Uh, what we did find, all right, and I'll jump to findings a little bit, in both 2017 and 2019, music education majors are not turning to alcohol and drugs as a form of coping mechanism, okay? We can tell, we can tell that just based on the questions that we ask, and I'll talk more about that in the method, but um, this also leads to professional burnout, this leads to uh, academic impact. This leads to um, developing healthy ways to approach it. And so if you're not familiar um, with this article, uh, it's by Chris, Krista Kubel. She's at the University of Central Arkansas. She did a great article in Music Educators Journal that talks a lot about effective uh, coping strategies for uh, stress and anxiety within the music education program. Music students are unique, okay? We say this all the time, but we're gonna go through what this actually looked like. And then there's this testing culture, okay? The testing culture, and this happens before you get to college. This happens to students ahead of time. There's a certain level of test anxiety. There's anxiety about grades. There's anxiety about getting into college. There's anxiety about getting into that top ensemble. There's anxiety everywhere. It's not just performance anxiety. A lot of times in music we say, well, yeah, we have performance anxiety. Well, it goes broader than that. There's all this other idea of testing culture that, um, and then when we get into further dual credit, advanced placement exams, all of that piled on, by the time you show up as freshmen, we have to figure out how to unpack that. 
Okay, so that's the background. So the primary purpose of this study was I wanted to revisit, I wanted to see, okay, we did this study in 2017, maybe it was just an anomaly. Maybe it just happened to be at the time of semester that we sent out the survey, maybe they just happened to be really stressed and really anxious. It couldn't, and so what I wanted to do is I wanted to try it again. I wanted to replicate the study, and I wanted to spend some time thinking about, is it changing? What, what direction is it trending? Okay, um, and I should mention at this point, I did work on this with uh, my amazing team of uh, grad students at Kansas State University. One is sitting in the back, Mr. Eric Thompson. You can wave to everybody. Eric was in my uh, research course where we uh, designed this. Uh, and then there were four others, Rachel Poss, Shelly Alexander, uh, Ching Ho, and um, Rachel, did I already say Rachel? R. Oh, and RJ Leonard. And so there were five of us, and they got to go through this process as grad students to see how to take a study from an idea all the way into publication. And so this has been a really great experience for them. And so we wanted to compare the profile. We wanted to see what's changed since 2017. We wanted to, this time we wanted to add, what wasn't in the initial survey was because we didn't know what we were looking for, is now are you seeking help? If so, why? If not, why? And if you are seeking help, are you still seeking help? If not, why not? If so, why? Because we wanted to get a little bit deeper and we added the level of screen time. On the amount of time that you spend on laptops and the amount of time that you spend on mobile devices. Because there, there is literature that ties those two together. And then we wanted to look at, are there any relationships that we need to be concerned about or that could help give us an idea of what's actually happening? So to kind of give you an idea, originally uh, we started with getting the Institutional Review Board. Because we were asking such personal questions, um, the university oversees the study to make sure that we're not asking anything uh, inappropriate. So we got the approval and the oversight. We had 195 universities that were selected. We did a random selection. We went to each state. We, um, and then we had a set of criteria that we, that we laid down. And then based on that, those um, uh, universities were chosen. We emailed the music ed faculty at each of those universities. Once we have provided their permission, we, uh, or once they gave us their permission, they forwarded out the survey to their students. We also did this through NAFME because we understood that not all schools participate um, in NAFME, and so we wanted to be able to get a wide enough uh, campus as possible. We sent out a survey about 10 to 15 minutes. This survey had three parts. Demographics, we wanted to know everything about the students. You know, how many hours are you enrolled in? How many, what we called uh, zero hours? Because we all know that, yeah, everybody starts to <laughs> giggle. That, yes, I say that I'm taking 15 hours, but those five ensembles that meet for a total of you know 10 hours a week, and I have to practice quite a bit for those I get zero credit for that, and so we wanted to find out how many zero credits, what are your actual credits, we wanted to ask, do you work, okay, and I'll just tell you right now the stories that I would get, because people would email me after they took the survey and they'd say, I want you to know this. I had one email me and said, I get done, I change clothes, I go work the graveyard shift from, I think it was like, I think he, he was working from like 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. to like 4 a.m. He would go, he'd take a shower, take about a 30 minute nap, and then go back and start his day again. Just to pay, just to pay the, the tuition, the fees, the bills. So, the, um, so we'll talk more about how much students are working, but that's what, all, and then we, we did the DSM-5. The DSM-5 is a screening tool for psychiatrists. And so we wanted to see how, we wanted to be able to pinpoint anxiety, depression, and uh, sleep disorder. And so we did that, and then we also gave a personality test um, to kind of see if there were personality traits that gave us any indication. And then we closed with um, a stress measure. And then we um, did all the data analysis through SPSS and Excel. So now let's get to the interesting part. We had 1,029 people that responded to the survey, okay? 
Uh, 47 states were represented. Uh, the only ones that weren't, I, th I want to say it was Wyoming. They were all west of the Mississippi. But um, we had 47 state represented. This was our breakdown, 31% male, 66% female, 2% non-binary, uh, and then other they had uh, was 1%. So that kind of sees how everything lays out there. Average age was 20.15, so we had a nice balance of ages throughout. 74% um, attended public uh, institution uh, versus 26 at private. Here was our ethnicity breakdown of music education majors nationwide. Okay, this, while it looks glaring, and it is, this is, all, this is aligned with what we know in the literature. Uh, when they did a study, I think it was 2015, well, it was posted in 2017, but he did the initial study. This is how many are applying for licensure nationwide. This is the almost exactly the same breakdown. So when we talk about, and this isn't a session on uh, diversity of the profession, but this, this creates an issue for us as music education majors. This is something that you all are going to be working to address in your career as music educators, okay? So I just wanted to be able to share this. While it looks stark, this is a good representative sample of what we have currently in the schools. Okay, so we have a wide range. Um, we have a national sample. So we have a pretty good idea that these are gonna be pretty well spot on. A majority were single. As we had expect, we did have um, a handful of married students uh, with some, uh, and I think we had two that uh, reported that they were divorced. So we do have um, a mixture there. A majority lived off campus. The average GPA was a 3.57. I found that to be really interesting because um, with all the stress, we're still performing well in the classroom. Average hours per semester turned out to be about 18 and a half. And, and that included zero credits, okay? Now, when I say average, that should be troubling. Right, because that's just the average. That's not counting what's going on on the upper end at all. Nine hours of rehearsal a week. Now, some of you are like, uh, now again, this is average, right? Some people spend a whole lot more time in there. Now, I think this, yeah. Only average practicing seven hours a week. That's an hour a day, okay? now. Keep in mind, okay, I want, you to, I want you to picture this for a second. Keep in mind that you're in class 18 hours a week, because those, that's, well, that's kind of a misnomer, right? So here, it's assuming 18 hours a week, but you also have to add in hours of rehearsal. So now we're starting to hit uh, at the around 30 hours a week, and then on average, they worked 14 hours a week. Okay, so now we're already at 44 hours. And so now you've got to figure out, well, where do I sleep? Where do I, and this is like active, like making your brain work. This isn't, all right, I get a chance to relax. You're constantly staying on. So then how does everything else happen? And, and so we're starting to kind of see the roots of, of where the stress and the anxiety. Um, they reported an, an average of six hours of sleep per night, okay? Which isn't necessarily terrible, but it's not great, okay? So for, this, for your age group, typically what they say is around seven to eight is what you should shoot for. We all know that certain times of the semester that's not gonna happen, okay? But they reported about six hours of sleep per night, 46 hours of screen time. <laughs> per week, okay? That's a lot of screen time. Now, that's laptop and mobile device combined. Um, laptop was a little bit less than mobile device, and that, that wasn't broken down. Uh, we, we went a little bit further, but we're spending a lot of time with, um, with the blue light, okay? It's the best way to put that. So that kind of gives you a background for what we're about to look at. 
Okay, overall health perception. Remember, in 2015, we asked physical, academic, and mental health. So we wanted to ask them, again, rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. You just kind of tell us where you're at. Physical, 5.8. So from that first time, it continued to lower a little bit. Academic, 6.8. Still pretty strong. Mental, 4.89. We dropped below that midpoint of the scale. All right, and so um, I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later on because this is an important point that I wanna make um, with, with their perception, and I say they're the people that took the study. Their perception of their physical, academic, and mental health, it's going to provide an interesting uh, point of discussion for us a little bit later on. And then I just said, on a scale of one to 10, what's your stress? And they said, and it came out as an average of 7.24. Now, because that's a little less scientific, I've got a, I've got a stress measure that we're going to talk about a little bit later that kind of indicates how stressed the students were. But what do you think some of their stressors were? Somebody just popcorn a couple answers. What do you think they, their biggest stressors were? Homework. Homework. Absolutely. It was in the top four. Getting enough uh, practice time. Practice time. Yeah. I'm not having enough time. What else? Auditions, all of that, and not having enough time, overworked, overextended. How many of you can't say no? You're like Ado Annie in, the, in, the, in Oklahoma, right? It's just like, I, I can't say no. You want me to play in that ensemble? Awesome. You want me to sing in this production? Sure, I can do that. That's not a problem at all. Because then you feel like you're letting somebody down, okay? And that creates a little bit, that creates added stress. All right, whether we like to admit it or not. So now let's start talking about the, the big guns. We'll start with depression, okay? Seven, so what they did was, is you and the, the people went in and they answered an initial questionnaire. If they answered in the, at a level, I'm gonna call it a three, it was a five point scale. If they were three or higher on any one of the depression uh, statements, then they were given level two questions. 74% initiated the level two questions. Okay, which means now we have to look at to what extent, so how a psychiatrist use this? Your first visit in, they will give you the, the DSM-5 and you'll fill this out and based on those answers, they will decide how to not necessarily treat because that hasn't gotten to the diagnosis part, but they put you into those tracks. They understand, they can kind of see how everything's set. 64.3% were moderately to severe, would have been considered moderate to severe depression. Okay, and what we have to understand about depression, sorry, I'm battling a, a cold, so I don't, I'm gonna take water every once in a while. What we have to understand about depression is not a feeling. It's a sickness, it's an ailment. And that it's not a pick it up by your bootstraps, put a smile on your face and just keep pushing through. And that's part of, part of this issue. 64.3 were moderately to severe, or would have been considered moderate to severe depression, okay? Anxiety, 84.35% initiated the level two questions. 74.48% of those we're considered moderate to severe. All right, so this right here, um, we'll talk about how it compared to last time, but this is, this, is some, this is our reality, okay? And I know, and we won't do a raise your hands, we understand that we know you're stressed and we know that there, there's this potential for anxiety and depression. Okay, so our biggest, uh, where I'm gonna spend once I share the rest of the data so that you can kind of wrap your heads around it, is we need to talk about what do we do? What are our options? Because you have a lot of options and we'll, we'll talk about those. All right, so help seeking versus stress. Um, so we, we gave them the stress scale and music education majors came in at a 23.93 as their average score on this, it's from zero to 40. 
there were uh, 10 questions, and they had to rate them from one to four, or zero to four. And the normed average for college students is a 14.92, okay? That's a little higher, all right? And I'm being somewhat um, deadpan there. That, you're overstressed, you're overworked. We understand that, okay? So we have to figure out how, how we address that. 51% um, reported seeking help at, at least one time. 51% of your colleagues nationwide. So to give you an idea, look to your left, Look to your right. One of those of those that you just looked at will have sought help at some point. Okay, that's that we need to be aware of that. Okay, and as future music teachers, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. We also have to understand that this is happening with our students. Okay, and so not only is it affecting us. But now we're becoming teachers and we're going out and we're adding another layer of stress to our lives, but we have to understand that our students are experiencing this in the same way that we are. And so we have to be open to that. 60% of that total are still seeking help today. Um, some reason for discontinuing, why they discontinued. Um, some of them said they were fine, they had been cured. Uh, some of them, they just don't have the time. I don't have the time to go over to the student access center. I don't have time to go to the doctor. I don't have the money. It's too expensive. I'm no longer on my parents' insurance. Or I just, I don't have the money to go and access. There are times, if you haven't sought out on campus, um, some of the reports that we were getting that there were up to six month waiting periods. Like you go in to say, I, I need help. The earliest they could get you in was six months from then. Okay, so again, this is where you being your best advocate. You have to say, this is, I need someone now. And so whether that be an advisor, whether that be um, talk, you know, staying there and advocating for yourself, access is a huge part of this. Okay, um, universities need to, un need to see that it is an emerging issue. They know it's an emerging issue, but they're understaffed, they're underfunded. So we have to, we have to figure out how to raise awareness for, for this. Um, of those who did not seek help, a majority of them refrain from seeking help due to extenuating circumstances such as fear of admitting there's a problem. There is a stigma with mental health. There's a stigma with depression. There's a stigma with anxiety. And they don't want to be labeled, all right? So that's part of it, lack of knowledge of resources. Some students didn't even realize that there was a place they could seek help on campus. And so if you know of someone who's struggling and you know where that point of access is, share it, walk them over. And, and just say, hey, we're here, to, we're here for you, we're here to help. Um, insurance was another one, and then just overall access to healthcare, okay? Um, many of them appeared open to seeking help, and as you can tell, only 51% had reported seeking help, but when we have 74% triggering the level two questions, for depression and 84% with anxiety, we're not hitting everybody that has these issues. We have to do a better job as a profession. We have to do a better job as colleagues of helping them along. So, some of the emerging relationships. Number one, we, we gave, um, we used the big five personality because it, um, it was the fastest way uh, to be able to get a, uh, a reliable, um, personality profile of our students. Um, screen time was significantly related to conscientiousness. Okay, now what that means is here you'll see negative 0.148. Okay, it's a, it's a weak relationship, but it was a significant one based on this sample. Which means as their conscientiousness went up, their screen time went down. So conscientious meaning very uh, attention to detail, um, 
and very orderly, organized, very conscientious, okay? As that score went up, their screen time went down. Uh, neuroticism, this is people that are overly anxious. Sometimes uh, they will sometimes be moody. Um, they uh, always appear to be on edge, kind of. As that score went up, we saw screen time also go up, all right? Perceived stress, um, that, that was the one to 10. The stress level was, um, so as screen time went up, your stress level goes up. Not a whole lot, but it is a significant relationship that emerged. As your screen time goes up, depression goes up. Your depression score on, on that DSM-5. Okay, so, and we do know that screen time is linked with depression and anxiety. And so this was, this um, begins to, uh, I will say validate that and confirm some of those other studies. Extroversion was significantly related with sleep quality, perceived stress levels, stress level, <coughs> depression, and anxiety, okay? Now this was really interesting uh, for me because you can see these numbers are getting bigger, which means that they're a stronger correlation. So as extroversion, as they reported to be higher extroversion or more extroverted, their depression goes down. Their depression score, anxiety score goes down the more extroverted they are, okay? That's something, now as when we're working with our students, we need to be aware of that. Just to keep in the back of our mind, this doesn't mean just because you're more extroverted, you're less likely to suffer from depression. That's not what this means. What generally, that the two are related in some way, shape, or form. That they move together is what we're looking at. Again, I should say very quickly, correlation is not causation, okay? If you've had any stats course, um, for your ed degree, correlation is not causation. This does not mean one causes the other. What it means is if one score is here and one score is here, they just kind of move like an ocean, okay? So as one goes down, it might go up, or they might do this, okay, in tandem. So they're gonna move either together or they're gonna move apart, but it just shows to what degree they do that, okay? So I just wanna make that clear. Uh, agreeableness. Um, so one of my other studies is looking at um, instrument choice and personality. And so the best way that I can, yeah, which is a whole not, it's a great study, it's a lot of fun. But I will say, um, tuba players are agreeable, okay? It, agreeableness was a significant pr predictor of uh, choosing the tuba. So if you know a tuba player, that's agreeableness, all right? So, sleep quality, and then the more agreeable they are, the lower their score was on, on depression, all right? Conscientiousness, we've talked about that before. It was significantly related to sleep quality, stress level, depression, and anxiety. You're starting to see, um, you're starting to, to see a pattern. Depression and anxiety is linked in some way to our personality. And so there are going to be indicators and we have to be able to dig that out and tease that out a little bit further. Neuroticism, these were by far the strongest correlations we had in the entire study. And so sleep quality, the more um, they, they demonstrated traits of neuroticism, the, the worse their sleep quality became, okay? Their, their stress level, the more neuro neuroticism that they, uh, shared or the higher their score, the higher their perceived stress, the higher their stress level, the higher the depression, and the higher the anxiety score, okay? So let's, let's compare that. 2017 to 2019, okay, just look at the top two scores. This was um, the score on the DSM-5 for anxiety. So 14.89, in 2019 it's a 19.82. We went through the same process, 
we surveyed in some cases some, some of the same schools, but the, the population was the same. The outreach was the same and anxiety increased. 14.62 to depression came in at 18.97. This, and I put this star here, these were significant differences. The, the, what that means is that this didn't happen by chance. These changes were so large that at this point, these came out that 99 times out of 100, this did not happen by chance. Okay, One time out of 100, it might have been by chance. 99 times out of 100. In the social sciences, we work on the 95% of the time it doesn't happen by chance is our, our uh, threshold. We were, we were beyond that. Okay. Now, this is the interesting part. Look at this. These changes were different. What do you notice is, what, what, how do you notice the difference? Somebody raise their hand. What, what does this tell us? Sam. Right, so the, 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 student, the student's perception of themselves haven't changed a lot. I will say all of these, while they don't look as big, they're all, all significant. All of these changes were significant, and, but you're right, they're, they're a little bit closer, so the students haven't changed. Their perceptions have shifted a little bit, but what we're seeing come out is a lot, a lot more uh, troubling for us as, as uh, teacher educators. Now, notice, they all went up, which means their perception of how they feel about these areas were improving, that they got better. But what we found is it didn't. The, the conditions were actually worse than what they were in 2017 in terms of what they were reporting to us. That needs to be something that we have to be aware of. Because, and it goes like this. And what's your name? Caitlin. I'm not I'm going to pick you out, but if I say, Caitlin, how are you? What, what's going to be your first? Okay. I'm all right, right? Mm -hmm. Or you might say, Anna, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Doing well, thank you. How are you really feeling? <laughs> and you, you, you laugh, but that second question is huge. Because we, as a society, we're meant to say, yeah, I'm doing well, I'm doing all right. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But that second, that, that you ask that second question, no, really, how are you doing? That's when you can start to get. So when, when you're out with friends, when you're out with colleagues, you're going to notice, and it might even be the slightest change. You say, how are you doing? And they don't answer you the same way. Say, no, really, how are you? Ask that extra question. I promise it's going to give you additional insight because we're willing to mask it when those changes are in place. Okay, so a couple things that I wanted to sh share with you here. Um, we're seeing increasing rates of uh, the, these scores on depression and anxiety. So my biggest, and as I'm looking out at here, I see a lot of yellow tags. So I'm talking primarily with uh, collegiate students today. Be your biggest advocate. Don't be afraid to say something. Talk to your advisor. Ask where the points of access are for help. Don't be afraid to ask. Because asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Asking for help is, it would be like, if you got, if you had severe bronchitis, or you had double pneumonia, you had pneumonia in both lungs, and you go, no, I'm fine, I'm good, I'll just, I'll drink this water and it'll clear it right out. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> and it doesn't, it doesn't work that way, okay? So be your biggest advocates. Have your, have your colleagues' backs. When you find those moments, find points of access. When you get back to your college or university, Find out, where do we go? What are, those, what are those access points on campus? Where's the student access center? Who do I talk about? Who do I talk to if I'm suffering from symptoms of anxiety, depression, 
or if I know one of my friends are, where do I take them? And then say, and it might be something, let's go get coffee. And they start to show a little bit deeper signs during that visit, say, hey, let's walk over this way and share that because that might be that call for help, okay? So be aware. Um, while it continued to increase perceptions of their health, significantly changed in the opposite direction. So they're, we're masking it, okay? So we need to be aware of that. And their perceived physical, academic, and we, we've talked a little bit about that. Are there options available to address these issues? Uh, and this was a question that came for me, um, including curriculum, scheduling, realistic expectations, okay? This is where as future music teachers, you all can be agents of change. Understanding that is the way that we've always scheduled things the best way to schedule things? And this would be a question that I would challenge even uh, to, to my higher ed colleagues. And it's one that I'm constantly bringing up um, as well, because I share this with our, student, or with, our, with our faculty. And my biggest question is, is the way that we've always done things the way that we should continue to do things? Just because we push you to the brink every time, is that necessarily what's best for how you're gonna be, a, is that gonna make you a better teacher? Yes, you need to be pushed. Yes, you need to have somebody challenge you. But if the challenge is pushing beyond academic and beyond developing you as a person and it starts to impact your health, that's, that's where we have to figure out where is that line? And I don't think we've ever sat down and really had that conversation. So when you're planning your high school choir, your high school orchestra, your high school band, and you're saying, all right, we're going to do this, this, and this. How are you going to allow for times for those students to let loose? How are you gonna develop a, and I know, how many of you went to Mrs. Dirk's yesterday? Okay, so I see a few hands. Um, there, there has to be these times where you get everybody together and you just relax. And it's not a rehearsal set. You have to develop that community. You have to develop those, those connections because if you don't know your students, you're not gonna know the signs. And if you constantly push, 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 you're not gonna see the signs. So how do we set it up? For those of you that are, now all of you are currently in a music education track. And I can ask this, how many of you have taken courses that you're like, I can use this. <laughs> yeah, okay. So now, I'm not saying that we totally upend the way that we do curriculum, but what I wanna ask is, are the way we're doing it now and the way we've always done it is that the best way moving forward? Because society changes around us. And are we meeting the needs of that society? I had a, uh, in, in our first article, I had uh, somebody tell me that, well, those, those conditions don't develop until their 20s, so they're not coming to us with these issues. And, and uh, your faces tell me everything, okay? And it's like, no, they're coming to us with these varied experiences and and anxiety depression is real in our high school students, in our middle school students, in our elementary students. You all are going to have impact. Being able to be aware, being able to sense, getting to know your students, that is huge. And it's the same way as develop those connections with your uh, faculty mentors so that you can have those uh, conversations. So, three areas that I want to focus on. Number one, education. I want to raise an awareness of this issue. It's why I'm doing this. It's why I'm gonna present this at an international conference in Helsinki, Finland this August, because I want people to know that this is something we have to talk about. This is the elephant in the room, okay? So, I, awareness, informed decision-making giving you all the tools to make those decisions and giving you the ownership of your own mental health. Because sometimes we think that it's not. 
We think that it's, it's n we don't own our own mental health, and yes, you do. Okay, you need to be assured of that. Treatment, avoiding the stigma, and if you feel at any time like, I might be depressed, or I might be anxious, or su suffer from anxiety, it's okay to just go take the visit. Talk with somebody. And then we need to start looking at how does this change how, how we structure the music ed experience for you all and future music teachers? And then how do we support you once you graduate? Because the reality is, is just because you graduate and you no longer have to practice for wind ensemble uh, uh, rehearsal, or just because you don't have opera rehearsal or musical rehearsal anymore, and you're still running lines and you're trying to memorize and get everything done before the deadline, that stress just changes its face, okay? And so we don't want you to burn out. You're the most meaningful thing in your students' lives. When they come into your classroom, they're your kids and they're looking to you. So you have, you've got to get to know them. And if you can empathize and, and really get to a point where, where you know them and you can pick out those small little changes, you're going to, regardless, you're going to change the lives of these students in some way, shape, or form, okay? So we've gotta be thinking about systemic change. Um, I've talked a little bit about that because we're running a little short on time. I wanna leave some time for questions. The last thing I'm gonna leave with, there is a model that, em that is emerging, okay? And when we talk about this in statistics, what this means is we're starting to see how all these relationships are starting to fit together. And so my next step is trying, because there were some significant predictors. We could, we could predict anxiety and depression scores based on some personality traits and, um, and based on some of a screen time usage. There were, there were some of those. I didn't share those today because I'm still in the process of weeding through what this looks like but I can tell you that a model is emerging where we're starting to see how all of these interact together and that it is going to make some change in how we approach curriculum, how we approach um, working with students moving forward. So some final questions that I wanted to leave for you all. Um, are we prepared to redesign? Are we willing to take that leap as future teachers? Are we willing to say that just because we've always done it this way, doesn't mean we always have to do it this way. Can we make meaningful change? Are we ready for that? And will our profession suffer if we don't make these changes? Are we going to run everyone out of the profession? Now, that's a little hyperbolic, but the reality is we have to ask ourselves, if we don't address this now, what happens 10 years from now? Will we have enough people that are finishing the degree and going in and staying in for 20 years to where we have full professional music educators out there? Or is it just kind of like this factory mentality where we, or like cars, we use them for five years and then when they're done, we go get a brand new batch. Okay, we have to ask ourselves these questions because if we don't address it on the front end, something on the back end is going to break. And I started this with a step in the right direction and I leave with the question have we made that step yet and I'm not going to answer that today but I want you to think about that moving forward and I want you to think about this as collegiate students I want you thinking about what is that next step how are you taking that next step as a future teacher to ensure that your students are going to have ownership and those experiences to where they can value their their mental health as they go through your program. Any questions? We've got about two and a half minutes. Yes? What are ways that you work to instill that community of intentionality that you were talking about mm -hmm. in your own school? So in our school, um, some of the ways that we do that is through, I, my advising sessions, I try and ask as many questions. And my door's always open. And I think some of my, my, my students are in here today. They can come in and they can share at any time. And there are times where we have those hard conversations where they're like, I just don't know what to do in this situation. Um, and I think it's about 
but that that doesn't happen just from me being the advisor that happens when they're freshmen and we come into intro to music ed and the first thing that we do is we talk about who we are where we're from what our goals are and then it builds from there and so i think part of that is a programmatic thing and then so anytime from there on out it's like you'll walk up and you'll ask, well, how did so-and-so go? Because they, they might say, well, I was in the opera. Or they might say, I'm going to this event this weekend. Um, or yesterday I was talking with some student teachers and I picked up TikTok. And I was like, hey, you need to see my new TikTok, all right? Now I'm a 40-year-old on TikTok, so that's kind of weird. But at the same time, it's just like, you know, constantly sharing and just kind of developing that community. It's, it, it's intentional from throughout the curriculum. It's not just one thing, it's not just one event that we do, it's how you establish those connections. All right, before you guys go, um, if you haven't had a chance to, we talk about all of these issues and much, much more on the Not Your Forte podcast. I know this is a shameless plug, but it's a huge resource for music education majors. It's available on Apple, Spotify, Google uh, Podcasts. We highly recommend just getting on there. It's myself. It's Mr. Tinkler down here. Um, this is going up as a podcast um, probably sometime at the beginning of next week once we get it post-produced. Um, but highly recommend, if you've got questions about advising, of uh, future teaching, uh, job placement, all of that, we cover all of those topics and much, much more on Not Your Forte podcast. Thank you all for being here today. What an absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, and I, I'm incredibly grateful for educators uh, like like Dr. Payne to realize that mental health is is a real issue, is a real problem that a lot of us students face, and to be trying to take steps towards how do we fix that? How how do how do we acknowledge it, and how how do we continue to help out our, our the students who who are are dealing with these things? Um, and just. Quick thank you to to Dr. Payne for continuing to work with me w with this project, uh, with with this podcast that that we do and everything. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful, and just secondly, I'm very grateful for for all you listeners, um, whether you've been listening for a while or whether this is the first episode you checked in. Um, we're gonna continue to keep growing, growing, getting larger, and everything. And and with that comes comes the quote unquote shameless plugs. Um, make sure that you you take time follow us subscribe rate five stars check us out on all of our social media pages we'll, we'll continue to be more and more active on those and share additional content um like us on facebook follow us on twitter instagram etc etc and we'll continue to grow we'll continue to share some just absolutely great content we're at the halfway point uh, between in, in the middle of the semester right now so as always I've enjoyed my time uh, chatting with you and catch you guys in two weeks.